Welcome to Poker Workout Wednesday number six. Uh, for those of you who are new here, go into the description, click and download our Poker Workout, which is basically a hand, some information about a player. You look through it, you break down what it is, and then I discuss it. There's been some amazing comments below about what's optimal, what's not optimal. We have a little community going. I'm loving this thing. Let me know what you would do. Okay, let's get into it. Charles. Early to mid 60s male, he has a cane and is wearing jeans and a plaid shirt. His baseball cap has an LAPD pin. I don't know, maybe he's a former LAPD detective or something like that. As soon as he sat down, Charles said hello to another player at the table named Duke. They talked a bit about Charles' recent retirement and health during the first few hands. Charles was dealt. As soon as he the waitress came over, he asked for a Budweiser. So, you know, good old American guy drinking a Budweiser. I think Budweiser is German or something. I think they were purchased by a German company. I don't know. Anyways, um, time at the table, 45 minutes, one, two. Charles bought in for 300, which is the table max. He currently has a stack of 265. We have been playing sort of snug due to a lack of quality strong hands. So we've been, you know, a little bit tighter, understandable. Charles posted his blind as soon as he sat down so he could start playing hands, but he spent the first four hands talking to his friend Duke. He limp called three of the four hands in the game. In the first hand, he check folded on the flop. In the second and third hands, he folded after a bet from a player ahead of him, okay? On the fifth hand, when Charles was under the gun, he stopped talking altogether and thought for about 10 seconds before making a raise of 10. He got two callers the button. That's like kind of like tell city when all of a sudden this player is like not really. Like when players like talk, 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 and then all of a sudden they just shut up and start playing. It's, you know, a pretty obvious indication that they're, they have a hand to perceive to be playable or strong. Uh, he got two callers, the button, big blind, flop came 10, three, nine, big blind check, Charles bet 20 and both players folded. We're going to give Charles credit for a good hand in that spot. As soon as his under the gun hand was over, Charles started up his conversation with Duke again, but he called a raise from the big blind and check folded on a nine king queen board. Over the next 30 minutes or so, he limped and called five more times and raised once, but never showed down a hand. So he's kind of like this limpy, spewy player whose range is probably easily defined in the sense that he limps with his marginal or the hands that he perceives to be decent, and then he raises with hands that have any sort of value and folds everything else. So it's not difficult to kind of put these players on ranges for the most part. Charles limps in middle position, and we have Jack 8 in the cutoff. The button is an older, nitty type player. What would you do and why? I, I mean, I would probably be raising this hand like every ever all the time i mean when we have position on when we have a position on a player like charles i think that we can play well i think i can play profitably a very large percentage of time i don't think he's that difficult to play against we induce a mistake by raising and hopefully he calls us out of position jack eight's a, a, a decent hand to play against him also take into consideration that we have that little bit of a uh, credibility because we've been quiet at the table for most times so we might give us credit even if we don't have a flop that we don't like we could represent it in position i think raising is a hundred percent fine um uh, hands like Jack Eight, as long as you don't uh, Jack Eight for you beginner type players watching this. We're, you know we have a really diverse group of people doing these workouts, which is evident below. Um, it's one of the interesting thing of the des descriptions or the discussions. Some of you, uh, some of you like use like really big poker words, or you you know you'll check your language and you'll say like blah 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 blah, blah. and like. It's it's similar to when I was when I was an adjunct psychology professor. So when I used to have, teach drug use and abuse, right? One of my lectures on drug use and abuse, and I used to teach a class, right? Where and the midterm, I'm sorry, in the midterm, I would tell my students, I would say, listen, guys, uh, here's your here's your question. Tell me information about one drug. Tell me all the information you know about one drug, okay? And like its benefits, its uses, blah 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 blah. So then somebody would say like, you know, marijuana, and they would talk about their personal experience with marijuana. So like marijuana makes you hungry sometimes, and it can sometimes make you this and something like that. And it would be cute, because it would always, it would be, you know, it would be right. I couldn't say anything about that. And so they go, D -d 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 -d. and it'd be like 80 or 90% of like pretty quality experience about marijuana. And then all of a sudden, the last, you know, 10, uh, you know, 
less 10%, they would say something like, yes, and it leads to suicide and death and blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, no, why did you say that? And I feel like there's some of those comments there where you guys are like saying really good things, really good things, and they're like, that is the GTO way to play. And I'm like, oh no, shoot myself. Like, so really check your language. I, I, I think that one of the most interesting things is when you have that discourse, really make sure that you can back up your own why and say like, this is a solid reason why. And don't, you don't have to use GTO as the reason on why something is right or not right at the poker player at the table. I think some of you have been really great in saying like, listen, this is what this is right because I don't feel comfortable in this spot, or this is right because there's not that many flops that connect with this hand and I don't like it. Like, that's great too. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you just, it can't be completely wrong. It can't be like, oh, listen, I'm calling here because my hand has a lot of value in this spot and your hand has no value in that spot. Like, that's what it is. I mean, I just want to take this opportunity to, dis to discuss that there's like a cluster of actions in poker that are wrong. And then there's a pretty decent margin of actions that are correct, as long as you have a solid reason behind the correct. And as long as that reason was actually the kind of reason, that was the reason that you had when you were actually playing. So yeah, in this specific spot, I think that, you know, there's two things that most, I think raising and folding are the better options. For those of you who are, you know, low on your bankroll, not that much money, don't want to get yourself in a tricky spot or afraid, got to read in the button, you think the button's going to raise you, don't want to get into this spot, you should probably just fold and get out of the hand. For those of you who are confident, I think there's, you know, might as well raise in this spot. I think there's a lot more merits or a lot more reasons for raising. We get the initiative post-flop, we're probably going to have no problem playing, you know, playing Charles in position based on his categorization or what he was doing. We could rep a lot of boards. Jack A can flop pretty decently. I just think that it's easy. It's an easy spot to probably have one of these. We raise, he maybe folds like 80% of the time. He calls a certain percentage of the time. Check, bet, and we take down a small pot. I think it's going to be fairly straightforward in that regard. But remember, you want to be thinking about what's right for you in this spot. Uh, I don't think this is particularly complex, but I do believe for those of you who like travel down this slippery slope road of like, all right, let me call on this spot and make a mistake. I really believe that for a lot of you who are new, you have to understand by folding, you don't have any ability to make a mistake because you're out of the hand. And by raising, you usually have more of an initiative that's going to defend or hedge your mistakes. So like raising in position is going to make up for a lot of mistakes that you could be potentially making post-flop because it has the embedded value of you are perceived to have a better hand. And that's going to carry you through in most live poker perception settings if someone's actually paying attention. So that's why I believe that that raising and in position is just such a hedge against maybe not such a developed or, you know, in-depth thought process. But let me know what your opinions are below. Post, comment, curious what you'd see. It's about it. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you subscribe. We are releasing between two to three videos every single week. Also, make sure you head over to schoolofcards.com slash value. The link's below in the description. It's basically our value email list where I, I do random webinars for free once or twice a month. I also answer questions, submit hands. We release videos that we don't always release on YouTube. So make sure you check out schoolofcards.com slash value. Enter your name and email and I'll keep you up to date.